and J is constant. All right, so, so to get the max, I'm going to use a row of 20 because I want to be on the outer surface. And then J, because it's a solid circular shaft, will be pi over 2 times the radius, 20 millimeters to the floor. Okay. Then I have to look at my total work. So which segment should I look at? Should I look at the negative 15, the negative 40, negative 10, or negative 70 segments? Negative 10. Well, which one will give me the largest shear stress? Negative 70. Negative 70, right. Yeah, the largest torque because it's, it's not inverse, it's directly related. So then my tau max, my tau max, here, my absolute tau max. So the negative just indicates a direction. We'll okay. talk about that in a second. But here at the max, so I would put I could put absolute values because I'm looking at absolute max mm -hmm. right here. So this would be 70 newton meters times. Okay, I'm using millimeters and millimeters, so I'll just go ahead and convert the meters into millimeters right now. So that'd be 1,000 millimeters per meter times the 20 millimeters divided by pi over two times the radius to the floor. 20 millimeters to the floor, like this. And it is, and, and I, I can calculate it real fast. Let's just calculate that. Uh, let's see, 20 cubed. Da -da -da -da. 70, then. You get, get 5.57, and it, you know, if we don't get this right, it should be Newton per millimeter squared, which is the same as a mega megapascal. So this is 5.57 megapascals. Okay. And so that is my absolute maximum shear stress. Okay, now check this out. Okay, so that's one answer. That's, that answers something for us, which is great. Okay, now here, if I look at cut four, so imagine I have here, I'm gonna use a, I'm gonna use my, I'm use my marker here, I'll use this right here, okay? So here is cut four. Okay, so let's use, here's the rod, here's cut four, I cut it, okay, I take it off the page, and now we're looking at it. We're looking at the face of the cut, it one of these, right? Okay, so good, we're looking at the face of the cut, okay, so this is for the stress distribution. One, four, stress distribution, the drawing that we're gonna use, okay? So I cut at four, I pick up my the rod, I look at the face of the cut, and this is what I see. This is drawn to a circle, okay? And the torsion is negative. So what is the direction of the torque? Or the torque is negative, so what's the direction of the torque? Is it going into or out of? Into the page. Into the page, great. It's going into the page, which means the torque is this way. Okay, it's so going into the page. I curl my fingers, so on um, this way, we go clockwise. But basically, it means I'm, sh I'm smearing my bagel in a clockwise direction. Okay, all right, all right, good, 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 good. And then, and then, here, now the question is, can I draw a stress distribution on any radial line? So here, if I just choose, we'll start with simple one. I'll just draw a horizontal radial line, right? And can I draw, so at the, the stress distribution in red, at the center, what's my stress? Zero. Zero, and at the outer surface, it will be? 5.57. Perfect, 5.57. Okay, so at the outer surface, it will be 5.57. Is the stress, shear stress pointing up or pointing down? Okay. Mm, what's the direction of the torque, the internal torque? Oh, down. It's so going to point down. Yeah. So the stress is going to go in that direction of the torque, the internal torque. And then boom, this will be 5.57 MPa, like this. And then I just let you know it's linearly varying because, you know, this key row of the J is linear with respect to row, right? And, and so then I would have, I could just draw the other arrows like this. Okay. Okay. And this distance right here is the 20 millimeters. Yeah. Okay. If I asked you what the heck is the shear stress, what is the shear stress is right here. If that distance is 10 millimeters from the center, mm -hmm. what would you say that is? Um, oh, half of 5.57. Half, exactly, half of 5.57, because it's linearly varying. I can do similar triangles. Mm -hmm. I can also just go back to this equation and replace the 20 with the 10. Mm -hmm. And that would give me, so this would be half of 5.57, whatever. Mm -hmm. Maybe 2.285, maybe? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Okay, so I can do that for any point on this radius. It's nice and convenient because it's linear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good. And in fact, so if I asked you, like, can you draw the shear stress distribution on this line here? Could you draw that? Yeah. Go for it, destroy it, destroy it. I'll draw it too. Okay. Okay, I'll use the same. Okay. So it was a perpendicular to that line. The dotted line being horizontal is just coincidence, yeah. right? But it just moved again. And, that, and at, at this surface right here, that stress is 5.57 MPa2. Okay, great. Great, 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 great. So the differential volume element is like, is, so if you can imagine, if imagine I can cut the entire, um, I can cut off everything around this point. Okay, I can cut, I can keep cutting and cutting until I have one single, a little differential cube, a little cube left, okay? Who cares about the word differential? Let's just say a little itty bitty cube, okay? And because my structure is in equilibrium, so is every itty bitty little cube, like, you know, here mm -hmm. on my on my structure, right? Mm -hmm. Every single one. So if I could cut out one mm -hmm. of these cubes, let's say this one right here, uh, I, I know I drew it like outside, but let's just say it's within the radius, it's so small, okay? You know, so this cube would look like this in 3D. It would look like this. Right here, this is the face of the cut. This is a cube at the outer surface. I see it basically represents a little itty bitty point, okay? And this is a cube, and you know, there's fancy terms, they call it a differential volume element. But on the face of this, on the face of this green cut face, I can, this is a unit area. So if I multiply the stress by one, it gives me a force, right? And so essentially what I have is, I have on this face, 5.57 megapascals. Yeah, okay. And I can draw the other sides of the cube right here. 
Okay, so if I could turn this cube around, right? Do I have a cube somewhere? I have lots of cubes. I have. This is this could be a cube, right? So here, here's a green face, right here. Okay, and this whole thing has to be an equilibrium, but I can only have like you know stresses or forces that are parallel or normal to these surfaces. Okay, and so then I need to be an equilibrium. So that means on the opposite side of this, I have an equilibrium stress that's pulling up to create that balance. 5.57 megapascals on the back. And now this thing is rotating freely in space. If I take moments about like this axis, it's rotating freely. And so I need on the top surface, I need a shear stress here, and then on the bottom surface, I need a shear stress here to keep it equilibrium. So I have to have some of the forces horizontally equal to zero, some of the is equal to zero, and this. And the reason the arrows kind of meet together is that if I were to look at a side view as an observer, let's say like standing right here, right here, looking like this, this is what I would see. I would see, I would see here's the cube, here's the green face, yeah, and my stresses on this surface, 5.57, on the bottom, 5.57, the top, the top, and all these stresses are 5.57 MPa. I have only shear stress. This is a condition of pure shear. So my def deformation should look, my deformation of this volume will look, uh, I'm probably exaggerating this right here, like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so like, if, like check out this book. So here, if I have shear, it's doing that. And it's like a pure shear, the deformation. And then we'll do the strain calculations. Ah, but it's all good. Yeah, okay. All right. And so that's, okay. But if you don't understand the differential volume element thing right now, it's okay. We're going to review it a lot more. We'll do it a lot more later. But when the learning gets more complicated, we're going to have that. But this is, uh, this is essentially it. The process is, you know, just like axle loading, internal loading, calculate stresses. And that's it. And the end. Bye bye. Wow. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Structure Free Office Hours. <laughs> All right, so in this, we'll talk about um, thermal stress. And so here, just a little background about thermal stress. And you can ask questions during the session. It's all good, right? So, um, that, so here, we're, we're talking about axially loaded rods subjected to um, temperature change. And so if, if I think about a an axle, let's like say, just a rod here. You know, if I have a rod like this, okay, and let's say it's completely free, completely free floating in the air, and I apply a temperature change to it, delta T, okay? The question is, will it deform? And will it experience stress? Internal stress. Okay. So it will deform. Yes, it will deform. It will expand in all directions. It will deform if I heat it up. So yes, deform. Yes, yes. Okay. However, for the stress part, it's like um, like as if I'm like lying out in the sun. You know, if there's nothing constraining me, I'm relaxed. I have no stress. Right. But like, um, but for a structural system to actually experience the stress, there has to be some sort of containment. It wants to expand, but then it's being constrained. So it will experience stress if it'll be yes, only if it's constrained. Okay. And when I say constrained, yes, if constrained, and. And when I say constraint, it would mean like there's some boundary conditions that, that kind of hold them in place. Okay. And so for us, because we're only right now we're only dealing with axial loading, we'll only worry about axial deformation. Okay. So it, it has to be constrained axially. And and so if I had, for instance, like a pin and a roller here, and again I'm only worried about axial deformation. Well, this thing is no, it's still not constrained. I'm as free to elongate. And when I heat it up, it will elongate a distance. I call that deformation due to temperature delta t. And this delta t, this temperature change, or this deformation due to temperature, is alpha. The way we're going to calculate is alpha, which is a coefficient of thermal expansion, delta t times l. And l is the original length of the of the component. So in fact, maybe I can put l naught right here. And and uh, alpha, alpha here, alpha is called the coefficient of thermal expansion. And it has units of essentially strain per degree. So sometimes we'll see it as like millimeter per millimeter per degree F, or like inch um, to per degree C, or in, in imperial, it'd be inch per inch per degree F. But a lot of times uh, the value will just be given as one over degree C, or one over degree F, like this. Okay. Right, so like, um, and maybe on the inside cover of various textbooks, you get the numbers, you can Google it, like with the coefficients of thermal expansion. All right, so this right now is not constrained actually, it will deform, but, but this, because it's free here, is, will not experience stress. So stress will occur, stress or internal stress or internal loading will occur if if I take the same rod and then like I, I you know I restrict its motion this way, right? So you know I can make it pin pinned, I can do pin pinned like this. Pinned, pinned. And in this case it's, it's no longer it's constrained and now yes, when I apply a temperature change, this thing will experience stress. Okay, because there's gonna be reactions that happen when I, when it tries to expand. Let's say due to a temperature increase or if it you know, if it's if I'm cooling it, it would shrink, right? And then there'll be the forces that way. Okay. So, so that's what's happening. So basically what it means is, is that the structures that we analyze with temperature effects have to, are, are going to be statically indeterminate. Okay, that means um, the structure, so structures or components, uh, components that we analyze with temperature effects, and especially if we want to consider stress, you know, we'll have, we'll be at least statically determinate, statically indeterminate. All right. And so let's, let's take, let's do an example. Okay. So we'll do an example here. Um, Okay. So we'll take some really like common cases. Okay, so like for instance, I have a fixed fixed.
next ride. Let's see. Let's consider so I'm given. Just keep those flow. I'm given. I have a fixed fixed rod. Um, it's made of two materials. What's the, you know, one side is steel. And it has the 200 giga pascals. Uh, the cross sectional area is 200 millimeters squared. And the coefficient thermal expansion for the steel is 12 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C. For, and then the other side is made of brass, which has a modulus of 100 giga pascals, a coefficient of thermal expansion, oops, uh, a coefficient of thermal expansion of 21 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree C, and a cross sectional area of 450 millimeters squared. And so, um, and I want to find, uh, let's see, this one, I want to find the support reactions, okay? And if I know the support reactions, it's fixed fix, if I know the support reactions, then I can do cuts and determine internal loads and calculate stresses based on those internal loads. Okay, so in this case, all right. And so one is, here's what the FBD looks like, or the schematic, what the schematic right here. So I have, let me see, where's my straight edge? I have a straight edge here. This will help uh, two different areas. See the steel, the brass is, is larger. So I have steel, a steel portion, and then it's connected to a, or equal weight, or equal weight, or the brass portion. Like this, and I have like that, so it's fixed and fixed like this. And, um, and then the, um, here, I have boom, boom, like this, and each of these is we'll say 300 millimeters. All right, okay. All right, so um, so I, what I would do, you know, if I, you know, I might label these points. Like, I would have A, I, I would probably identify these continuities, you know, so here's, like, this, this concentrated force here. This is a change in material, and here is a, another point, and I, I might label those A, B, C, okay? I label those A, B, C, but that's not important right now. So right here, I'm, I'm really, I want to find the support reactions, and I have here, so I, I can draw the support reactions in any direction. So which way do you want to draw them? To the left or to the right? Sure, to the right. To the right. So here, I'll say, here I have A, X, and again, we're only focused on a, a, axial loading. So we only have here, technically, there might be shear, like a, a vertical reaction at the moment, but we're only dealing with axial deformation due to temperature. And so we're, we're just going to deal with this. So my only equilibrium equation to equilibrium equation is, is here. It's AX plus CX equals zero. And, and basically what it says is that I, and really from the equilibrium equations, I, I find that, oh man, I've got two unknowns. One equation, so and this is one degree of indeterminacy, which means I need one compatibility equation to solve this out. Okay. Oh, we didn't even talk about what the temperature changes. So this whole thing is experiencing a temperature change. Uh, this one from 10 to 20 degrees. Is that it? So like this whole thing is experiencing a temperature change of 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, it's uniform, a uniform temperature change. So I need a compatibility equation. All right. If I if, if we go back and just think about uh, what we did for for statically indeterminate rods, when I have a fixed fixed number right here, and fixed, fixed, you know, I, I'm looking at, I would be looking at the deformation, that relative axial deformation, and you, you do happen to remember what the compatibility equation of the form would look like. Like, so here, I'm fixed at C, at C, I'm fixed at A, is there any relative deformation between C and A? Like, does C, does the distance between C and A increase? No, it doesn't change. So the deformation between point C and point A is nothing. So that, the way we would write that, we would write the compatibility equation, or the equation that we know about its deformation, is that the relative deformation between C and A equals zero. I notice that I have three discontinuities, I would make two cuts like this to analyze internal loading, which means that I would have to look at two segments in my deformation equation. So when I, if I think back to, you know, as a side note, when I think back, you know, this deformation equation was like the sum of NL over EA. It was kind of like a sum of segments, right? And, and really, you know, it, it doesn't matter. We use the NL over EA because of the internal loading. Like if the internal loading were constant, then we use this NL over EA. If the internal loading were very across the segment, then we use integral formulation. So here, this, but what we do, the good thing is that we identify based on each cut that I have to evaluate two segments. And this is the sum of the deformation of B with respect to A plus the deformation of C with respect to B. Right, so cut one here was between A, B. I call this cut one. Cut two was between C, B. And those are the segments that I'm interested in for my deformation. Yeah. We're used to deformation due to force, okay? But because we have a temperature change, right? We have a temperature change, I, mean, I call this zero. This deformation in segment BA can be because of two things. It can be because of force and also because of temperature. So now I break this up. I say, well then, it's really by the principle of superposition. I, I'm gonna focus on delta BA due to force, or I call it N, due to my normal force, plus the deformation of B with respect to A due to a temperature change, delta T. And then I can do the same with segment CB. I'm gonna break up the loading by superposition, delta CB due to force, plus the deformation of CAB due to temperature change. That's it. And now, now, I, I'm going to make all kinds of substitutions. Okay. So I'm gonna, I know that, at least I know in segment BA, the internal force here is going to be constant. Right? So I don't need to use an integral formulation. I can use NL over EA. So here for segment BA, oh wait, what was, was steel segment BA? Steel. Yeah. Steel.
PhD in the, the second is steel and the second is brass. Okay. And so here, second BA is steel. So I would write here, if this is again zero is equal to, this would be NBA, LBA over E of the steel, A, B, A, or area of the steel. In fact, I think we wrote area of steel, so I'll write AST, area of steel, plus alpha of the steel, the depth of delta T, times the initial length of the steel, and I'll put LST, or segment BA, I can put LBA, put LBA, and then I can go, yeah, does that make sense so far? And then I go ahead and repeat